I am very happy that we have four of the authors with us today to, to just drill them on the real question here is how do we get to a truly sustainable society? Uh, and I want to start with Jenny, uh, Jenny Moore, uh, the Director of Sustainable Development and Environmental Stewardship at the British Columbia Institute of Technology, who wrote Chapter 4, Getting to One Planet Living. And this is really the big question. How do we, all consumers in this room, get to a space where we're actually living within the one planet that we have? And uh, stealing a little bit of your thunder to quote one of your statistics, if you don't mind, you, you paint a pretty disturbing picture saying that even if the average Vancouverite, and you use Vancouver as a case study, even if they followed a vegan diet, avoided driving or flying, and only walked, cycled, and used public transit, lived in a passive solar house that used almost no fossil-based energy, and cut their personal consumption by half, they could only reduce their per capita ecological footprint by 44%. That's still 60% above their fair share of biocapacity on a planet with 7 billion people. So how the heck are we gonna get there? <laughs> That's your question. All right, five minutes or less. Uh, thank you, Eric. Yeah, it is, it is shocking, and that was part of the endeavor of this research initiative to really come to grips with what ecological sustainability, living within Earth's carrying capacity really means. The reason why, if we did all of those things, and we should do all of those things, it's not to say we, we don't need to, we need to do all of those things, but even if we did, we are so energy intensive in our economy, and we rely on a national government service for, for, for example, the military, the treasury, that we cannot get below one planet living unless we engage with senior government. So it's, civil society can be an important player, but our senior governments and the dialogue that we need to have with our senior governments around a peace based not on force or strength, but a peace based on recipro reciprocity and, and um, volunteerism. And I know I sound idealistic, but that is where your last bit of energy that you yourself as an individual can't squeeze down is coming from. So it's got to involve the governments in, in a dialogue with civil society. Did you want me to espouse more on what One Planet Living could look like? I would love it. All right. So the good news story is that there is a lot of things that we can do, and, and a lot of them... Louder? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Should I repeat what I just said in the back? No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Very quickly, so very quickly the synopsis is the reason why we cannot get to one planet living even though we do all of the important things like avoiding consumption of meat and particularly red meat, um, using public transit, cycling and walking from all of our transportation and for commercial goods and public transit we would need to be relying on fossil free energy, reducing our building energy consumption by at least 44%, ideally living in passive buildings to the degree that that's possible, and reducing our consumption by half, and particularly avoiding the use of paper, which surprisingly is a huge portion of the ecological footprint, even though we recycle a lot of paper already. So in Vancouver's case, they already recycle 70% of their paper, and they still would need to reduce that by half. So the reason why we can't get to one planet living, even if we did all of those things, is because of the energy intensity in our economy, and particularly because of the senior government services that are provided for the benefit of all citizens including the military and the treasury, for examples. So that's where that last piece, the 60%, is coming from. So it's not enough for civil society to engage in this issue. We have to engage with our governments. This has got to be a cooperative effort or it's not going to happen. So in terms of painting a picture of what One Planet Living could look like, there are roles and opportunities for every player. But we will not be living, chances are, and you already know this, most of you, that we're not going to be living in cities in suburban dwellings. We're going to be living in high-density mixed use. It still can be somewhat ground-oriented. But we'd have to get to a mode split where 86% of the population is walking and using cy uh, cycling and transit. And that kind of density is very close to uh, Tokyo or Hong Kong. It's what Vancouver achieves in its downtown central business district, not what it achieves across the whole City, but in the downtown. So that's the density that you would potentially need to get to in order to be car free, to truly meet all of your services, your needs, your jobs within a walking distance or by using public transit and cycling. 
So it's a very different way of building and a very different land use. And I'm just painting one vision in my case study. That doesn't mean that there aren't other solutions. It also means that the land that we're not using needs to be converted into agriculture in the urban domain and in the peri-urban domain. So right now, agriculture is responsible for most of the transformation of our land, uh, deforestation, etc. So we need to get a handle on that because density is never a free rider. You cannot just densify and not also increase the number of mouths that need to be fed and some basic services and needs. So it is an efficient way to live, but we still need to account for agriculture. So cities of the future will be internalizing a significant amount of agricultural bioproductivity. Um, think about green roofs and living walls, but also think about peeling back the pavement and using your peri-urban areas as agricultural growing areas. And di changing our diet is probably the most important thing that we need to do in this area. So even if you reduce your red meat consumption by 50%, that would be one of the most important things you could do to get to one planet living. So the other most important thing is getting out of the car. We need to live in car-free cities. And then it goes down the scale from there, building energy efficiency, which technology can help us achieve, but being smart in how we use energy being prudent in what we choose to buy and really moving into a sharing economy. So I noticed there's lots of bike shares uh, already here in the city, but think about sharing just about everything um, and really asking yourself, do I need to buy anything? And if I do, can I repurpose it? Can I buy used? Can I fix what I've got and adapt it? So that's, that's it in a nutshell, Eric. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny. I want to ask the next question to Sandra, who wears many hats, uh, including a senior fellow at World Watch. Uh, the director of Global Water Policy Project and uh, freshwater fellow at National Geographic, and authored the chapter uh, five, Sustaining Freshwater and Its Dependence. And, and Sandra, in the opening pages of your chapter, you lay out some scary statistics, and I want to repeat them here, uh, maybe to set the mood. Uh, but the interesting thing is the way you framed it, that our population has gone up by a factor of 28 in the past 2,000 years but supplies of fresh water are the same as they were then, today. And now, with so much of the world's population using huge amounts of water in their daily life as consumers, as, as Jenny was just hinting at in all the products that they're, they're using uh, in the transportation, we're seeing lakes uh, shrinking, rivers running dry, aquifers being depleted. All the while, we have 800 million people still without enough basic access to fresh, drinkable water. Uh, and yet we also have another billion to two billion people projected, unless we do truly find ways to in integrate family planning better and can stabilize the population lower. But if not, we're having a growing population, a growing consumer population, as Bob points out. And I, I have to ask, is it even still possible to have a sustainable freshwater <coughs> system? And, and obviously, if so, how? <laughs> you want the honest answer? Yes, yeah, okay. yes, absolutely. Um, I think the honest answer is yes. Um, but it's going to clearly take a very, very big change in how we use and manage and value and even think about uh, fresh water. Um, three fundamental, can you all hear me OK in the back? It's OK. Um, Three fundamental attributes of fresh water that, that underpin uh, our concern about sustainability is that it's the basis of life, it's finite, and there are no substitutes for it. So we're in the midst of this big transition away from fossil fuels, hopefully towards solar and wind and renewables. We can't transition away from water. So grappling with that finiteness and non-substitutability is really a key, a key aspect of this. So when I think about sustainability when it comes to fresh water, I think about it in, in, in these terms, that sustainability means when it comes to water, providing enough water at, the, at sufficient quality at the right time to sustain both people and ecosystems. And where we tap groundwater, making sure that we don't deplete the supply. So if you apply that sustainability definition across the board in the world today, we're not making it anywhere. Now, where we have made some progress is in providing safe drinking water. If you look at over the last uh, couple decades, we've made substantial progress in providing basic water needs, 20 liters per person per day minimum, um, for lots of people. But still today, we have 800 million people lacking that. 
Now, one piece of good news is we've actually met the Millennium Development Goal of having the proportion of people lacking safe drinking water. We actually met that goal five years ahead of time. We achieved that in 2010. The goal was for 2015. So that's pretty good. Now, the important thing to remember with, with the drinking water challenge is that it's not a question of physical water scarcity. The media confuses this all the time. It would only take one-tenth of one percent of all the water we're using today in the world to meet those basic needs for those 800 million people lacking it. So it's not a question of scarcity, it's a question of access, providing the pumps, the wells, the financial resources and the political will to do that. So it's a highly achievable aspect of, of the sustainability challenge. Related to this is the fact that we have so much hunger tied to water scarcity. Um, we have, depending on food prices in, the, in any given year, between 850 million and a billion people who are chronically hungry. 60% of those people live on farms. So they're hungry even though they live on farms. Why? Very often it's because they cannot access the water that sometimes is right beneath their feet. Because the irrigation age has largely bypassed them. The technologies that have been developed haven't been affordable, right, for the dollar or two dollar a day farmer. So that's beginning to change and we're seeing tremendous progress with low cost drip irrigation, with manual pumps that allow poor farmers, dollar a day farmers to access groundwater that sometimes is literally right beneath their feet, but without the ability to access it means they're, they're not growing anything during the long dry season, which for them then becomes a hunger season. And so $35 treadle pumps, equally inexpensive and modular drip irrigation systems that are designed for radical affordability, is what my, one of my mentors, Paul Polak, calls it. So this is beginning to move out in India, in sub-Saharan Africa, and is literally transforming the, the poverty equation in a lot of these places and, and alleviating hunger. Um, third thing, we need to begin restoring flows to rivers and ecosystems. We have had a lot of ecological disconnection as we've gone about developing water. We have now f nearly 50,000 large dams, up from 5,000 in 1950. We're literally capturing 26% of the planet's runoff through rivers in our reservoirs. That's a huge change in the hydrologic system and it's driving a lot of species to extinction, driving a lot of ecological decline. So some of the experiments to watch, the Murray-Darling River Basin, after a decade of drought, what National Geographic uh, has written about as the big dry in, in Australia, is totally revamping how it thinks about the Murray-Darling River Basin and the future of agriculture there. So there now, as the government is investing billions of dollars in improving irrigation infrastructure, raising water efficiency, and buying back some water entitlements, and giving water back to depleted rivers and wetlands in the Murray-Darling. It's the boldest experiment in rebalancing human and ecological uses of water that's taking place now at the river basin scale. We're gonna need the same thing in the Colorado River Basin in this country. Um, at National Geographic, we're beginning to work on, with conservation partners, on restoring flows, headwaters to the delta in the Colorado as a pilot experiment here. So this is extremely, extremely important. A um, couple other quick things. Um, one of the best insurance policies we can take out in terms of building resilience for climate change is investing in ecological infrastructure, watershed protection, making sure that we have the wetlands in place to absorb floodwaters, to release those floodwaters slowly during droughts. If you think about what, what the Mississippi Basin has gone through the last two years, we had horrendous floods in 2011. We had a huge drought the next year. So one year the river was raging and flood. The next year the river was basically too low to even support fishing, uh, shipping, remember? Well, what if we had, I took a look the year of the flood and found that there were 35 million acres, 14 million hectares of wetlands in the upper watershed that were no longer in existence. They were essentially gone, drained um, out of that upper watershed. Now, if some portion of those wetlands had been in place, it's possible we would have had less of that destructive flooding downstream. These wetlands act like a big sponge, right? They absorb the flood water, hold it, and then release it gradually over time. So we might have actually mitigated both the flood and the drought had we had some strategic level of those wetlands in place. So we can start to rebuild this if we, if we choose to. Um, last thing is, 
what Eric referred to, and we've heard a little bit about this morning from Bob and others, our water footprint. The fact that every day, everything in this room, if you look at it, takes water to make. We think about water when it comes out of the tap, but the biggest part of our water footprint is our diet, energy, and then clothes. 700 gallons of water to make one cotton shirt, 630 gallons of water to make one hamburger. So Jenny's point about meat being the big, the big shifting place, it is true. We could do a lot of uh, benefit for water, for energy, for climate, thinking about rejiggering our diet a bit. So thinking about our water footprint, it takes the average American 2,000 gallons of water every day to keep our lifestyle afloat. So that is completely unsustainable if you think about multiplying that by 7 billion people. So, so just thinking about our footprint from a personal level and beginning to shift it down uh, to create ecological space for the bottom billion of people to come up to a more sustainable um, and healthy level of consumption of water and food um, is something we, you know, we could all take, take part in. Um, I have to say one more thing. Am I over my time? Close. Maybe, but go ahead. <laughs> um, I didn't talk about groundwater, which is really important. Um, this has been largely an out of sight, out of mind issue up until very recently where the NASA satellite program uh, called GRACE for Gravity Recovery and, and Climate Experiment has begun to document the degree of depletion of groundwater in China, in India, in California. Um, we have other data on the Ogallala Aquifer. And if you add this up, um, it's now clear that 10% of our food production today is met by the overpumping of groundwater. The numbers in India are closer to 15%. That 15% of the, of, the, of the food production in India is met by the unsustainable use of groundwater. So we're literally taking tomorrow's water to meet today's food demands. So unsustainable at, any, at every level. So we're beginning to see, you know, the attention to this in a way that we hadn't, but not nearly enough to, you know, to, to bring, in, uh, bring us into balance. Um, in Andhra Pradesh and India, you've got villages, a million farmers now beginning to budget their water use, change their cropping patterns, irrigate more efficiently to try to keep the aquifer they depend upon from being depleted. Even in the Ogallala, northwest Texas, water districts there are beginning to put in place um, what they call allowable production limits, essentially a cap on production uh, because the aquifer is being depleted. They have a goal there of making sure at least 50% of the water in the Ogallala is still there in 50 years. So these kinds of caps, these kinds of sustainability boundaries, if you will, are really crucial to you know, improving our water productivity, getting more value per gallon. We're gonna need at least a doubling of water productivity to have any hope of achieving sustainability, um, probably a tripling and quadrupling beyond that. Um, so the pieces are there, but we haven't seen it scale up. So I think the, you know, the challenge is to take the best of what's out there and begin to, to spread this more, more widely. Sorry if I spoke too long. Okay, it was fascinating, so thank you. Uh, let, let me turn to Eric Zenke now. Uh, Tom already mentioned a, a fellow at the Gund Institute. Uh, yeah. but also a visiting lecturer in the Sam Fox School of Visual Design and Arts at Washington University in St. Louis. So a very nice complementary perspective there. Uh, and Eric wrote chapter seven, Energy as Master Resource. And I wanna continue to dig into the unsustainability of the, of the economy, I guess. Um, really, you note in a very interesting way that an economy sucks up low entropy inputs and spits out high entropy waste. And that the goal of this process, in theory anyway, is to provide human well-being. Uh, of course, if we want the economy to continue to do this, it has to be sustainable, and this depends on using energy sustainably. Uh, you, you introduce us in your chapter to a complex idea, that of energy return on investment which can serve as one measure of how sustainable an economy is. Uh, I'd love for you to unpack that term because I don't think everyone uh, is familiar with it uh, and just kind of explore what that means and, and how we can take that term and apply it to make economies of the future sure. sustainable. Sure. Um, energy return on energy invested is uh, it's a fundamental way of thinking about um, the energy input into the economy. It's to, to, to correct you uh, about one thing. It's not actually a measure of sustainability. Uh, you can have um, it, it's separate from that. Uh, energy return 
on energy invested asks and answers the question, how much energy did it take to get a unit of energy into the economy? We're used to thinking of energy in terms of dollars in, dollars out, or maybe dollars in, energy out, energy units out. But more fundamental than money, we can make the prices be anything we want with different policy or print more money or print less of it. That'll change the price. But we can do very little to change the fundamental geophysical thermodynamic truths of energy. Our technology can, can adapt, can change um, some of the computations. But basically, um, you need to ask, for instance, um, how much what proportion of a barrel of oil did it take to get a barrel of oil out of the ground and into the economy? Or what proportion, I mean, barrels of oil seem to be the coin of the realm, we understand it. Um, how many barrels of oil does it take to build a windmill that will give us how many barrels of oil? Well, you can reduce these to, um, to just ratios without numbers. The ratio for oil today worldwide is about 19 to 1. That is, for every uh, 19, for every one barrel you invest in getting oil out of the ground, into the system, into the economy, refining, shipping, et cetera, et cetera, you um, have 19 usable barrels of oil. Um, the bad news is that for new oil, like tar sands, it's down to 5 to 1. Um, that's kind of bad news. The good news is that wind and solar, uh, wind is coming in 17, 18, 19 to 1, sort of depends on siting. Um, so that should tell you right there that the petroleum era is over. If you look at it in thermodynamic economic terms, uh, oil is no longer a bargain. It's no longer a good deal. We don't tend to look at these things in thermodynamic economic terms. We look at them, uh, we're, we're driven by history, by where we are now. If you start uh, with a blank slate, you'd build wind. But if you have an enormous infrastructure and a whole lot of automobiles and a whole lot of powerful oil companies that are being treated as citizens for the purposes of donating money to congressional campaigns, um, you end up with, um, we're gonna have an economy that runs on oil for a while longer. Um, in 1920, the payoff on oil was 100 to 1. And if you work that out as a percentage, that's a 10,000% rate of return. Uh, you all probably know the name of uh, Ponzi, the guy who um, gave his name to that scheme. Um, and he did that by, he was going to, um, he was going to arbitrage postal coupons after World War I when the rates, monetary rates got out of whack and he, writing to his sister in Italy, he discovered she can buy stamps way cheaper than I can. And what if I get her to buy a whole bunch of these international postal coupons, send them to me and I sell them, I can make a 400% profit. He told some friends about it and they gave him money to invest. Um, and those friends told friends and those friends told friends. And it was an era in which there was a kind of get rich quick, driven, I think, by oil, uh, he built a pyramid scheme. He started paying, um, he started paying new investors out of, old investors out of the money he got from new investors. He never actually, it seems, bought any postal coupons. It would have been hard to run his scheme because, mm, you know, a 400% payoff on a two cent stamp isn't really gonna, I mean, you have to buy a ton of them. Um, the scheme started unraveling when Charles Barron, who gave his name to uh, Barron's, he invented that newspaper, he actually did some macro analysis and he figured out that for Ponzi to actually pay back all his debts, it would require something like 20 times the number of international postal coupons that were then in circulation. Just couldn't do it. Um, and that led to an investigative report that led to the whole scheme falling down. I think we have built uh, an economy that's a pyramid scheme that was built on that incredible 10,000% rate of return that oil gave us. And as I have taken to telling students, if you have an engine at the heart of your economy that pays off 10,000 to one, you can believe any damn economic theory you want and you're still gonna create a lot of wealth. We need to begin thinking of economic theory that's consonant with the realities uh, that we face physically, which means thermodynamics. Herman Daly is, is um, one of the founders of this way of thinking. 
we need a, an economic understanding that's grounded in the realities of physics and thermodynamics. Um, I have much more to say on that, but I'll leave you with maybe uh, one thought that um, one implication of th seeing things this way. Re renewable energy is not a, a magic bullet. It also has resource impacts. It has uh, environmental impacts of their own. Uh, what you're, uh, an idea that your chapter can explore with more fully. I would love if you could explain some of these impacts and how they can be dealt with to ensure that the transition to a, a renewable energy economy is sustainable. Okay, so um, the material requirements and environmental impacts of renewable energy varies widely depending on the technology you use. On louder. Okay. Okay, I'll start over. Um, the material, material requirements and environmental impacts of renewable energy depend widely on the technology used, the location of installments, uh, and management practices. Um, to take one example of land needs, um, there's more than enough land available in the world to meet uh, global energy demand with solar, wind, biomass, geothermal, and small hydro generation. However, in individual cases, um, the ecosystem impacts of individual renewable energy projects can be quite significant, um, especially when it comes to large utility scale uh, power production. Um, in particular, the aggregate impacts of uh, ecosystem disruption from small hydropower dams and the agricultural land needed to grow um, biomass feedstock crops can be especially damaging. Um, in terms of uh, water consumption, um, concentrating solar power and geothermal energy consume more water than other renewable energy technologies, um, but even still, um, these water needs are still lower or comparable to what's needed for um, conventional thermal generation like coal, natural gas, and nuclear power. Um, the, it's a particular barrier for um, concentrating solar power um, because some of the world's strongest solar resources are located in deserts where uh, water resources are relatively scarce. Um, there are alternative technologies that can help overcome some of these barriers. For example, uh, air cooling systems are available for concentrated solar power that use air instead of water to cool them, although with some cost to the uh, energy output. Um, in addition, uh, growing biomass feedstock crops can result in unsustainable water use uh, depending on the type of crop used, the location, and uh, agricultural practices. Uh, when it comes to material requirements, um, metals and some rare earth scarcity can pose limitations to uh, solar photovoltaic panel manufacturing um, and manufacturing of uh, certain types of wind turbines and small hydropower turbines. There are a lot of proven alternative technologies and materials though that can help overcome some of these barriers. And then in addition to the uh, natural resource consumption needs of renewable technologies. There are other environmental impacts. For example, solar photovoltaic panels have been known to have cadmium emissions, although these are much lower than those associated with fossil fuel combustion, and they can be mitigated through uh, solar panel recycling. Um, wind turbines has been well publicized, um, can be responsible for disrupting bird migration routes and resulting in uh, bird kills depending on where they're located. And then um, deforestation and biodiversity loss can be associated with almost any type of renewable energy project where land is used, which is any renewable energy project. Um, however, these are typically the most significant for biomass generation, hydropower, and geothermal. Um, so how do we get around some of these barriers? Um, first and foremost, uh, energy demand should be reduced through energy conservation practices and energy efficient technologies. Um, second of all, um, siting of renewable power plants should be uh, fully integrated with sustainable and just land policies that take into account ecosystem sensitivity and uh, the rights of communities living on or near the lands affected. Um, any renewable project that would seriously compromise the surrounding environment or threaten local communities should be resited. Um, furthermore, uh, renewable energy development uh, should be in total accord with priorities for sustainable water use um, to ensure that a significant diversion of water from natural systems is avoided and to preserve scarce water resources for
for human needs. Um, in addition, uh, strengthened environmental regulations are needed for uh, material mining and extraction. Um, in particular, um, new regulations are needed to ensure the safe expansion of rare earth mining in countries around the world. Um, so there are definitely technical and sustainability challenges to transitioning to a global renewable energy system, but through smart policies and planning, um, we can get there with solutions available today. Thanks, Jack. I think now we will open it to the audience. We have, uh, we started a little late, so I'm gonna steal an extra five minutes from the next panel. So we have about 15 minutes for the uh, questions. Uh, how about here? Just uh, one sec, we'll get you a microphone. Um, I'm David Schwartzman. I'm uh, now retired from the Howard faculty. I'm a biogeochemist. I really appreciated uh, everyone's uh, presentation and I look forward to digging into the volume. Uh, I think Eric's uh, presentation, emphasizing that energy is really at the root, is extremely important. And I want to just share brief, very briefly a study I did with my oldest son that's available on our website, solarutopia.org. Um, these are peer-reviewed studies. Um, we used a conservative figure of the energy return over energy invested for wind and solar, uh, around 20. And then we did a mathematical model and showed, I think very convincingly, that we can completely replace all the unsustainable um, energy sources in about 25 years, if we start very soon, and use less than 40% of conventional petroleum reserves to do it. And not only that, and I'll finish now, uh, not only that, in terms of uh, reducing energy consumption, by all means, the global north needs to do that, but we know that most of humanity suffers from energy poverty. So here's the, we, right now we have seven billion people, and the minimum to obtain a state of the science life expectancy is about three and a half kilowatt per person. Now, if you multiply that by 7 billion, that's 25 trillion watts. Right now, we're delivering 17. So that's the challenge. We show we can do it with conservative values of wind and solar and with existing uh, conventional petroleum. So please comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, and th that's for me to comment on? Sure. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, interesting, interesting. I'd, I'd like to look up that paper and those numbers. Um, yeah, the, the energy impoverished, um, it will be difficult, I think, to bring the rest of the world up to the standard of energy use that we are accustomed to even if we were to be more efficient in our energy use. So I am very interested in seeing what sort of assumptions you make about efficiency and, and what that energy is going to purchase. Um, your comments lead me to throw in two more remarks that I had in my list here of things that I, I might say. Um, one is that um, you come close to this, this idea I've had that um, we need a kind of, we need to implement a kind of ecological uh, categorical imperative. Um, you know, the golden rule was like, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, that's not a very sophisticated, it's a good foundation for ethics, but it's not really sophisticated because you have to pay attention to context. Doing unto someone else what you would have them do unto you isn't always the fair, right, just thing to do. So Kant put a little wrinkle on it and said, so act so that the moral principle by which you act, you could safely will be applied to everyone. Oh, and that's like the golden rule at a meta level. The ecological version is so act so that you could uh, reasonably and safely will that seven billion people do what you're doing. And by that standard, much of our behavior falls short. We heard a little bit about ways in which our behavior has to change. Um, nothing goes to waste in nature. 
if we seize energy flows out there now, there will be consequences. It may seem to us that uh, putting up a wind tower captures energy that was, quote, going to waste. But nothing is wasted in nature. Uh, there will be consequences and impacts uh, for impacts as a noun. Hmm. Uh, there, there will be consequences of capturing more of the solar flow that we currently do not capture. The one place that it's certainly going to waste is the energy, the solar energy that falls on our buildings that we don't capture. We've already destroyed the footprint on the ground the green stuff that used to use that energy. And it's just pounding on brick and concrete and going away. Um, we could capture that. That's truly wasted. The other stuff, I'm not so sure it's wasted. Uh, finally, um, I wanted to put in a pitch for getting prices to tell the ecological truth. Um, and some of what we continue to hear from those who care about sustainability is about changing our behavior. And yes, at the individual level, we should try to live by our lights, live by our precepts. But I have come around to thinking that 30 years of moral suasion, finger wagging, and nagging, you should walk, not ride, you should buy uh, paper, not plastic, recycled paper, not fresh paper. The should, should, should approach has not changed things. Uh, if we had prices telling the ecological truth, the economic choice would be the ecological choice, and we would be on a better path towards sustainability. Thank you. About right here in the second round. Thank you. My, I'm an Indian, Rabin Malik. I'm in Japan and former official of United Nations University. India's Mahatma Gandhi have said a simple statement, let's live simply, let, so that others may simply live. I, mean, I guess he meant about India when he made that statement. But if I apply that statement to this, your, your, let's say, getting to true sustainability, globally speaking, I think there are many challenges around there, and particularly in respect to energy. I think which is the heart of the problem with the nearly 1.3 billion people in the world having no access to electricity. What mechanisms are there, global mechanisms, to make sure that this sustainability is possible? Who will make sure of that? What kind of global governance do we have for that purpose? Just a question for anybody in the panel who would like to address that. Thank you. Who would like to address that? <laughs> Uh, I will have known as well, but I feel like I just spoke. All right, well, I'll start and then you can follow. So, um, you know, okay, I'm not an American, so bear with me on this. But in a deregulized market economy, you become very, very efficient and very, very immoral. And I think that who is going to be the citizens of some of the strongest powers in the world, and those power dynamics are changing as well. And we've completely failed in the last 30 years to really grapple with this. I think we had a stronger social movement in past decades than we do today. So I'm not sure how we're going to create a global compact to live simply so that others may live. But I agree with you, it is definitely what is on the global agenda for discussion. And how we engage civil society to work with our governance systems in ways that begin to hold accountability back to the people, governments for the people, by the people. I know I'm sounding a little cliche here, but, but really that's, that's a big piece of what's missing in this puzzle, I think, right now. So if somebody has a little bit more political savvy, I'll turn it over to them. But. Oh, I, yeah, now I can't jump in. Oh, okay. Re requires I'll me to have more to savvy. Oh, oh, better, better. Um, uh, so two thoughts. One, um, Hmm. Is sustainability still possible? Um, I have taken to telling students, we're going to have a sustainable economy, civilization, at some point. I mean, by definition, an unsustainable thing doesn't last. So the question isn't, will we have sustainability? The question is, what? several questions. One, what will it look like? Which is a, a way of asking, how much human pain and suffering is there going to be between here and there? Um, 
and then you know the the pep talk is anything we can do to minimize that is morally useful and valuable and a reason to get out of bed in the morning even when the newspaper makes it seem like you shouldn't um, the second part of that what governance organizations here part of I think part of the tragedy that oil imposed on us is it gave us the power to treat um, it gave us the power to defile a commons that is larger than the largest effective political organization we can imagine. And I don't see much of a solution to that except that we learn to retreat from that margin. Democracy evolved on a planet with far fewer people that didn't have the powers given to us by oil to wreak havoc. Um, and that idea that mm, you can be free to do what you want on your own property is fundamental to some people's notion of democracy and we've been learning gradually, not quite as fast as we need to, that no, everything's connected and you can't do whatever you want on your property. Nations are going to have a hard time learning you can't do whatever you want on your continent. Um, can we get there in time? I don't know. We'll have a sustainable system sooner or later. A final point on that before we switch to the next question. I would plug the final two chapters of the section two, which both look at the politics of how do we get this uh, sustainable society. Uh, and the final chapter, in fact, is by Annie Leonard of the Story of Stuff Project, who really advocates that it's about using civil society not in their role just as consumers, but to really mobilize them to be primary drivers of this, of this political transformation. Uh, how about we go, well, here and then further back. So right here, while you have the microphone. Uh, hi. Is this on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Mike Kennedy. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, I liked what I heard Bill McDonough say about 15 years ago at a Bioneers conference that sustainability is not enough. And we have to be about restoration. Um, and I think we're talking about sustainability a lot when we should be talking about restoration in the economic equations, in the environmental equations. Um, and, I, and my question is for Eric. Um, I've been intrigued by the, 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 the valuing ecosystem services for, since I first read about it in natural capitalism. I'm wondering, you, you mentioned about how do you price um, the true economic cost in. And I know you guys have been working on this, but uh, is, is there any actionable um, um, uh, plan for that? Um, we have in, in an incubator company that I'm um, uh, housed with, a uh, company called Savinia that's labeling now um, different kinds of uh, manufactured goods for their real economic, for their real costs, uh, energy costs. Um, and, and so I'm wondering if something like that is in your scope of imagination? Uh, well, it, um, yeah, there's, there's something called Paguvian taxes. This uh, economist Pagu talked about internalizing externalities. Some things impose more social cost on us than we pay for in the price, and those things should be taxed so that their uh, cost in the market reflects their social, not just their economic cost and you could say ecological cost. And there would also be subsidies. Solar energy needs a Peguvian subsidy. Coal and oil need a Peguvian tax. So that, that's kind of separate from valuing ecosystem services, although you could uh, begin talking about um, the price that should be charged to someone when they choose to cut down forest or to fill in a wetland. Um, I think those usable uh, I think that healthy natural capital is so rare that we shouldn't put it on the market and sell its destruction that way, but that just may mean that I'm thinking it should be priced infinitely so that no one can do it. So. And I saw your hand up uh, yep, in the seat. Yes, uh, I'm Jerry Kirks. I appreciate the discussion. One thread that seems to be running through is the potential of national policy somewhere along the way that makes some of these things happen. And I wonder, do you have any research or are there positive studies that show when national policy has changed to bring about some of these things that it benefits a constituency? 
I mean, certainly in the, just thinking about the water sphere, um, you know, we just celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Clean Water Act, for example, and that was a, you know, at the time, a very progressive uh, national policy around water focused on water quality, on water pollution, um, you know, which had a tremendous impact. I mean, the Cuyahoga River had just caught fire, you know, a couple of years before passage of the act. Uh, Rachel Carson had drawn attention to, uh, to water issues during the 60s. And so I think they came at a time we were concerned about pollution. And it was a, a national response to a, to a problem that had, you know, big benefits, but there were big gaps remaining from that. You know, the fact that we didn't deal, the act didn't really deal with the non-point source pollution. So all the agricultural runoff, fertilizers that are causing the dead zones and, and so on, the pesticides and all that basically have been left out of that. So we've had to go back and, you know, and, and rejigger that. We don't really have a national policy when it comes to water. It's interesting in, in this country. Some other countries do. Um, but the really innovative stuff often is happening at the watershed level, at the local level. You know, water is a global challenge, but it's a very local issue in that we don't move it around the world the way we do oil. You know, it's, it's how we use it and manage it locally is really what matters. But national guidance can make a difference in terms of how we, how we do that. And I think this idea of just thinking about your response to, uh, to your question about, about taxes, you know, what I've seen in the water sphere is that this idea of setting a sustainability boundary, the idea that you don't want to degrade ecosystem services to the point where an extra um, unit of degradation costs more than it's worth in terms of what you're getting in terms of economic benefit. Do you know what I mean? And so setting that boundary, I think, can be more effective than, than trying to price these things, than trying to tax these things, because it's, it's sort of a proactive move. And I think that's what the Murray-Darling Basin is trying to do. That's what some other areas are focused on. I think that's got some good untapped potential. And then once you set it, then you've basically set aside the water that needs to be maintained to keep ecosystems healthy. It tells us how much we have to work with, which drives up productivity. It tells us we have to get more bang for the gallon or the liter because this is all we've got to work with. The rest is needed for nature. So I think that's a really um, good policy we can move toward. Thanks, Henry. I'm not sure if that beeper was for us, but I think uh, we're just a few minutes over, so I think I'll stop here uh, so that we can keep on moving to the second panel. Thank you. I'm sure there will be...